Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode three of the Beyond Cinema podcast presented by New A Media. My name is Brendan Grant, and I'm joined, as always, by Chris Murray. In today's episode, we'll be talking all about the current state of camera technology in the industry, talking about some of the newest cameras that have entered the market, some new technologies that will be coming out soon, and maybe even at the end, I'd even like to share some predictions for how we see the trends projecting into the future. I think this is all a really perfect time to be talking about this topic in today's episode because, well, there's some really exciting new cameras out right now and some really exciting things on the horizon, things that are going to be coming out soon. And uh, yeah, overall, I just think that the industry is going um, is going to be changing really rapidly soon. And uh, But anyway, we'll get into that a little bit later. So to kick it off, I just wanted to ask you, Chris, about your experience at CES this past year uh, in Vegas. You were there filming for the event. I know that much, um, but we never really got to chat too much about it. And I know you were there um, filming for other industries, but did you get a chance to check out any of the new film stuff going on? And if so, what did you see? What did you like? Just talk to you about it. First off, I'll start by saying, what's up, everybody? Um, pleasure to be back talking to the masses, to the ears that are listening. And I don't think we can can move past the fact that I've exposed that I'm a new time Zencast user because I like <laughs> didn't have like the the sound linked up right. So when I went for the intro, we were already recording and I panicked and I just clicked the intro outro, which is the very first like stock button. <laughs> it played like the stock Zencaster. So I'm sure anyone that's explored Zencaster as a podcasting option has like <laughs> used heard that, that track before. Yeah. yeah <laughs> the smoke on the water of podcasting, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, I was supposed to go with Ooh, something more chill like this. That's nice. Okay. Which is actually from uh, <laughs> my brother, Luke. That's like from my brother, Luke's music. Oh, wait, like he, he made that? Um, I'm not sure if he made that beat or not, but it's his song. I know that for sure. Oh, that's awesome. So um, you like imported it? Yeah, yeah. Nice. Plugged it in. So I was supposed to open with that, but I didn't have it lined <laughs> up and I, we were already rolling. So I clicked the Zencaster intro outro. But beside <laughs> that, we are CES 2020. Actually a weird experience for filmmaking, I think, where it, it's, I mean, it is the consumer electronic What's the S one? What's the S in that? Uh, not shopper. Symposium? I don't know. No. <laughs> now I don't even think we're allowed to talk about it without knowing. So CES stands <laughs> for the Consumer Electronic Show, of course. Show, of course. <laughs> I want to say symposium. So anyway, CES 2020. Yes, I was there working it. I was actually filming for like a lidar company out there because oh, that's okay. like the, that's the big push. So. As far as camera technology goes, it seemed to have been a bit stagnant there. We mm. didn't really have too much new to announce. It was just old technology or technology we already knew about that was kind of just showing representation to remind people it still existed, such as Black Magic. DJI drones were there. Um, the, it was all geared towards LiDAR technology, though. They have like new updated DJI drones like Phantoms and Mavics that have like technologies for for like doing like real estate scouting i guess for architecture things like that um huh more more i guess like not business based but like more used as a tool than a creative tool. right uh, what's the word i'm looking for i don't know it just there's a lot of lighter technology now the canon 1dx mark 3 was announced while i was there yeah definitely i, I definitely want to talk about that today yeah the, the big announcement, I think, was Sony announced like their AI car. So the, like I said, this whole thing was all about AI automation and LiDAR technology and like cameras. While that's getting there, like that space is kind of limited for cameras currently. Right. So it's more about like other technologies. That's what CES was really about. But the 1DX, yeah. So 5.5K raw, right? 12 bit, 60 frames a second for a DSLR camera. Yeah, sick and uh and that's full frame full frame yep yep 20.1 megapixel full frame cmos sensor so or cmos depending um that means global shutter right i believe cmos sensors are global shutter i, I might be wrong um, about that but i don't For, know I, th generally... I think like i think like 
all of Canon's are CMOS sensors, aren't they? Yeah, know. yeah. So generally, I think uh, basically across the board, Canon cameras are usually pretty good with their uh, global versus rolling shutter. I, you I see, like rolling had, shutter a lot. I thought they like, had a rolling shutter, but yeah, I'd be curious know. about that. Because um, I remember it was a big deal when Blackmagic announced that they had a global shutter in their camera, and I feel like it wouldn't have been a big deal at the time if it, if it was like so commonplace in Cameron or Canon DSLRs. Yeah, true. Well, I know the the six K still has rolling shutter. The the black the P, the BMP CC six K. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Oh yeah. They need a new name for the pocket one camera. Of them has it's global. no longer pocket. One of them has global. Might be the four K version. I'm not sure. Um, black magic i can look into that it's it's almost in like the trap red fell into where it's just like too many models that are too close sounding and named like it's not it's not cut and clear like we don't know what their products are right now i mean if you're a big black magic fan and really following them you do but like they just keep changing like how many urses are there now i think it's a yeah i think it's a black magic ursa mini pro is what is like the new one. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And I, I feel like the the Pocket Six K is sort of taking over now to the point where the the Ursa and the Ursa Mini aren't really relevant anymore. Like I don't see people talking about them or shooting with them anymore. It's yeah, basically, there's an Ursa, an Ursa Mini, and an Ursa Mini Pro. Yeah, I think Crazy. global global shutter might have been an Ursa Mini thing. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure. I'm pretty That's sure. Right? But yeah, so it uh. It has anyway. like a new Digic X processor. You CF Express cards. So is, I guess that's different than is that different than CF two point oh? Probably, but what's kind of annoying is uh, I read that it still has a recording limit of thirty minutes. So it's still at the end I mean, of the day, it's still a DSLR. You know? Yeah, it's still stills camera. Like that's yeah, the, it's so strange that like it kind of doesn't have like. I guess they have their C, their cinema series, like their C two hundred. Their right. I guess, it's weird. It's it's weird. They really try it's to separate camera. It. Like, what but are I, you gonna <laughs> what, like? You, we just have been asking for four K. Yeah. For Canon, that's all we've been like. Please give us four K. Give us four K. Four K. And then out of nowhere, they're like, "Fine, here's five point five K raw. Stop bothering us." And it's like, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's dope, but like, we don't need all that. That can, like, is this going to cause overheating issues? How how much can this can or like at five point five k raw? How long can you like actually record? Right. I don't know. Yeah, and it's. I think it's like. A, you can correct me if I'm wrong. If you know, but I think it's like a like it's like a six k sensor, but the video is like five point five k. Or no, 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 mm-hmm. no. I'm I'm wrong about that. I think the sensor is like five thousand four hundred some pixels, but um, the, the stills megapixels might be higher. But I guess it would be weird. Well, stills to, is twenty. Yeah, like 20, 21 or something, I think I read. but It's 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 on the lower end. But the 1DXs have always been on the lower end because they're high frame rate cameras. They're like sport cameras, sport photography cameras. Mm, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So uh, price range, $6,500. So it's sort of like right in the midpoint between um, yeah. like a C300 Mark II and like a Blackmagic Pocket, basically. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. But yeah, they've always it's, been it's like... It's about the same price, a little bit more than the current 1DX Mark II. Right, it's, I right. think it's like 2000 more. Right. But I'm not sure how much that camera was initially when it was released. It might have been around 6000 It's kind of interesting, though. It feels like it's almost coming full circle um, from the DSLR revolution, you know, mm-hmm. back in like 2009 or 2008. Not exactly sure, like around that time, and now it's like we're we're back on it again. Like these, it, it seems like the large format sensor sizes are sort of coming back into popularity. People are like using them again, or it's becoming like more desirable, you know. And now oh, we're, we're back to these like small cameras. The full frame large formats totally more desirable right now. Yeah, it's like it's it's super trendy, mm-hmm. and I. I still like while this is a great camera, though this one DX Mark III, it's like an awesome camera. Everything that it says is like everything you want. Right. But then when you look at the price point, that seems reasonable. But then you look at what these other companies and brands are offering at that price point, and it's just that it's not good enough, you know, for 
what you could get a Red Raven for and what that can do in comparison for right. like not that much difference of a price range. It just it's still not good enough. I mean, five point five k raw is great, but max it's twelve 60p. bit. Yeah, it's twelve bit. Where the four point five k you get out of the Dragon Raven sensor is like sixteen bit. So yeah. And you can do, I mean, at 4K, you can do up to 100 or up to like 240 frames per second or something like that. Or at least well, 120. And then depending on what your yeah, yeah, compression yeah. settings and stuff are. But yeah, in terms of like when you're trying to match that whole combination between how much resolution you have versus like what your frame rates can actually be. Um, yeah, I definitely still feel like the Raven is probably better bang for your buck. But yeah. And then you have cameras like the, I mean, really what's what's exciting me in this last year has been the pocket 6k and just hmm. how how much it's undercutting the market at like a two thousand five hundred dollar price tag. so this is and and shame on me but i've kind of never been on that black magic bandwagon well totally I like, understandable like, i like what they represent you know i like like right. you you early adopted in with the pocket yeah. cinema camera back back in the day and 2012 <laughs> And you, you, your camera was putting out better images than anyone else's cameras, but just, just the limitations, like what they're doing is great, but it's like, they're just like starting the race too soon. Like it would be better if they just like took the time and like took a little bit of time off, relied on their broadcast sales of products so they could take a break with the cameras and really hone something in and just release one solid product. So they don't just keep, they, they like instead of giving firmware updates, they're giving hardware updates to their cameras, right. you know, like very frequently. Yeah. But their cameras aren't, they're cheap, but they're still like a, a price, like a hefty price point for the, the market that they put themselves in. Yeah. So I, I, because of that, I, I always look at black magic as like, you guys are still trying to figure it out. Once you guys do, I'll start paying attention again. So as far as this pocket uh, 6k goes, I actually don't know much about this camera at all. And like I said, shame on me for like not even keeping up to date with Black Magic. But I'm interested on you to like educate me a little bit yeah, on sure. this camera because yeah, I I don't know anything. So it definitely seems like uh, in terms of popularity, it's definitely trending right now. A lot of people are using it. I think mainly that's that's a price range thing to mm-hmm. offer 6K at under three thousand dollars is kind of insane. Um, I mean, the 4K came out. People Wait, were under how much? It. It's under three thousand. It's two thousand five hundred dollars. What for six k? Yeah, so th- that's what? why it it's not seen as like it's not two thousand. <laughs> yeah, two thousand dollars. Yeah, man. <laughs> Compared to six thousand five hundred for five point five k, it's raw. Yeah, six k raw. What? Yeah. Um, oh my god! That's I think they're insane. advertising about twelve stops of latitude right now, compared to like uh, uh, like the the uh. What is it? The Canon C three hundred Mark II is like fourteen stops. So, yeah. so comparably, it's not. It's not like. But I mean, twelve stops is still plenty, right? But um, I mean, it's great. And it's it's uh, they technically advertise and it. Realistically, you're not going to be able to utilize all twelve in most cases. So yeah, yeah, that's sort of like yeah, pretty maxed out there. But um, so what was I just saying? Oh yeah, so technically they advertise it as a Super thirty five sensor. Mm-hmm. But it is like a couple millimeters smaller in both dimensions Interesting. Um, than Super 35. But it's like close enough to call it a Super 35 and not an APS-C technically. Whereas like uh, we'll talk about in a little bit the Komodo, which is like on the opposite end where it's technically a Super 35 sensor, but it's actually a little bit larger in both dimensions mm-hmm. than Super 35. So it's sort of the opposite. But for all intents and purposes you basically won't notice a difference. It's a Super 35 sensor shooting 6K uh, raw at $2,500. Um, it's It's got an EF mount um, for the, just all, like built into the body. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's using, basically you'll be using Canon lenses on it. And I'm not exactly this sure what the it's pocket? frame rates. Yeah, the pocket 6K. And so the, not swappable, fixed EF. Yes, fixed EF. Okay. Okay. Now it is like a short flange distance, so I'm pretty sure you can mount a PL adapter to it. I'm pretty sure. Like I'm 90 percent sure you can. To do an that. EF mount? Yeah, like EF to PL. I'm pretty sure that you can do that, uh, just because the flange distance is so short. Interesting. But yeah, you, you definitely cannot with the 
breath. Um, the biggest thing for me now, I've only used it on set once. I was first day seeing for it uh, about a month ago, and the biggest thing for me, we were doing an outdoor shoot, and the sensor just doesn't have any uh, IR uh, filter on it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you're using um, ND filters that don't have that aren't IR NDs, then you're going to oh, be getting gotcha. a lot of IR pollution. And so yeah. on that particular so you shoot, need like to like some IRND because, but well, red, they kind of have that built into their sensor. So it's yeah. not necessary to have the IRND. Yeah. And, uh, in comparison, and but you same pay with, a price for that. Same with, uh, with Ari, their cameras have, or basically have IR filters built in as well. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's like, we have this luxury of using red cameras all the time. It's like, we forget IR is even a thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, because like, when you're not on a level it's like you have to get to the level where it takes the problem away for you to realize yeah like, like how good you have it <laughs> well yeah because like e even back then if i was if i was at that stage where that was my main camera the pocket 6k and that's like my instead of a red like I'm, i probably wouldn't even be thinking that much about the ir at that level yeah true as i should be and know? it's it's pretty insane like what I've realized we were shooting outdoors and the DP basically wanted to shoot wide open or like at F2 the whole time where your exposure is like, should be an F32 and you're trying to shoot at F2 and mm -hmm. use ND to compensate for like, however many, like, what is that? Like eight stops or like more than eight yeah, stops over. Yeah. So it's like that much ND makes your image look like just red, <laughs> just the, mm -hmm. the entire image just like goes gross and it's mm. not like just a uh this is something i learned recently ir pollution is not something that you can just correct in color because it's not like it's it just shifts the entire image red and you could just shift it more blue and post it's mm -hmm. like it, it changes different colors different amounts and in different directions yeah. so um basically especially greenery like trees and grass and stuff just completely loses it basically goes like orange so yeah, completely loses all color. So skin tones wind up usually like looking like, all right, like you can pull them back, but you can't really save, especially when it comes to like trees and grass and stuff, you can't really save it. So yeah, mm -hmm. that was a big uh, lesson for me working with the pocket 6k for the first time was just that like IR is like a big deal that you really need to consider. So if you're shooting on it, definitely make sure you have uh, like nice IR neutral density filters and they do exist. You can buy them. So it's, it's not like an unfixable solution, but it's something like you always yeah, need Tiffin to think about. Yeah, Tiffin makes them. Tiffin has IRND. Yeah. yeah, and they make really good ones nowadays. They're just not that cheap. Yeah, and you need to have like a matte box with the, yeah. whole, with the whole thing. So just something to think about um, that sort of makes a big difference. My, but... my ND, my Tiffin set is not IR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I have a red, so. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I recently watched a comparison video between a C300 Mark II and the Pocket mm -hmm. 6K, and the, um, I believe it was C300 Mark II, or no, uh, C500? Ah, oh, damn it, I forget what the video was. Whichever one does 6K. Mm -hmm. Is that the C500 that does 6K? I should uh, look this up before I talk about it. The C5, I've never actually used the C500, so The I don't Mark know. II, was it? Um, yeah, the Mark II. C200. So, yeah. The C500 Mark II, which yeah. does 6K, it's a full frame. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's the one. So it was a comparison between those two cameras. C500 Mark II full frame and the Pocket 6K Super 35. Mm -hmm. And uh, so first and foremost, the biggest thing was just in terms of sensor size, the Pocket yeah. 6K with a 35 millimeter lens on it was still not as wide as the, the, uh, the, C5, C, the C500 Mark II with a 50 millimeter lens on it. Mm. So that's is the C 500 full difference. frame. Yes. Full frame six K. So cool. the, the reason they were doing the comparison was because these are two six K cameras, even though one is full frame and one is super 35. So that was like the biggest thing, but I was actually pretty surprised to see how well they compared other than that. Like obviously the sensor size is a humongous difference, but like otherwise they looked really similar. Um, they both, held up in terms of color in terms of latitude um i did notice the c500 mark ii had like a little bit better handling of the highlights but neither camera was clipping the highlights at all 
Um, and the, the C500 Mark II also had like better looking skin tones, but I wouldn't say the pocket camera skin tones were bad in any sense. Um, yeah. Black Magic has definitely improved on the look coming straight out of camera, whereas like the old school, like pocket, like 1080p pocket camera from like 24 or 2012 or whatever it was, like the color coming out of that was like really just like black and white. Basically, it was like no <laughs> color. <laughs> Super flat. So nowadays it's like it kind of almost like it always felt like a tin, like a sepia, like I don't know, it was like green. Yeah, also no, like definitely, it's like shadows brown, brownish. Felt brown. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually learned that that's um, that that is it was an intentional thing that Black Magic did, making the colors go in those directions. Apparently, they were trying to mimic uh, old school like Kodak mm-hmm. film. Apparently, Kodak used to do that. Um, which is kind of interesting, but yeah, it definitely doesn't doesn't look like what your eye sees. Yeah, for sure, it's it's a little bit too strong for me, definitely. Um, so, who's the market for this camera? Is it like right? So that's where it's like really weird. Is it's it can compare pretty decently with a C five hundred Mark II, which is a ten thousand dollar can or no more just than the a, price is insane to me. Yeah, like but, I still can't get over that. Because of the price, it sort of undercuts the market. It sort of changes what That's we like see as the professional a professional camera. Five D Mark IV. Yeah, but it holds up next to a ten thousand dollar camera. And That's now, insane. I mean, we'll talk about it in a couple minutes here. I still have a lot of other cameras I want to bring up, but the Komodo is like yeah. I feel like a direct response to the Pocket Six K. Because Red is like, well, shit. Now that there's a a six K camera that consumers can buy that's only two thousand five hundred dollars. Do you think like red worries about black magic? I think now they do. I don't think they did before, but I definitely think yeah. they do now. And, I don't know um, if they do or if they don't. I was just curious. Like if if their only competition is Ari or if they if they actually are worried about the bottom line because they always hint that they're like gonna touch that market and they never quite get there, you know? So it's they like the Scarlet was like their budget of the time. Yeah. And that was that like what 15,000 just to get in on that at, yeah. like for the so it wasn't super affordable and that's just for the brain. And then like the Raven was like the new test of that entryway, which I think came in at like 7,000 starting and then I think it went up to like 9,000. They like decided that it was <laughs> it was like too cheap. Or yeah. something like that after three or four months yeah after you had already bought it which was great timing <laughs> and and it seemed like they kind of they abandoned the raven they abandoned the scarlet w and they kind of like cut out the bottom line and said like no more low budget cameras again uh, yeah and no, after I, the I, hydrogen I, failed i just it seemed like okay they're like done messing with the lower end market and then they they talk about the komodo they're gonna go at it again and it's like they're repl- like yeah, it's it's replacing the Scarlet and the Raven in one, I think. Yeah, I think the thing is, is like times change so fast. And when they made the Raven and the Scarlet W, it was at like a weird middle ground between being cheap and being expensive. Mm-hmm. And so now instead of like having a middle ground camera, they're going to have a low end camera and a couple of high end cameras. And all of their high end cameras, if you look at them, they all fulfill a very specific need. It's like, one is like the full frame, whatever. And then the other is like the the Gemini, which is the, you know, it's only 5K. It's like lower resolution, but it gives you the... the Low uh, light the dual The dual native, yeah, the low light. So it's like either high resolution or low light. And the Gemini is seen as like having even better color science than um, the 8K Helium. So it's like they have those two big cameras now, and now they're, they're going to have the, and color, the Monstro, which is like the cheap end. And the Monstro, yeah. The Monstro is actually... Like in demand, people actually want that thing. Yeah, totally. because full frame. Yeah. Like the trend, like the monster is more and more in demand because of the full frame, but it's just so damn expensive. Mm-hmm. So it's just, I just, I don't know. It's just weird. Like me being a DSMC two user. Like, what does that mean if, let's say, I were to go from the Raven to the Komodo? Like, does that because? The cool thing with the Raven, it could it goes either way. The Raven's a lower end, same with Scarlet W, the lower end of the DSMC2 line. But yeah. you have to pay the premium price of 
the accessories because the accessories apply to the monstro too. You know, the same SSD native, the same right monitors and all point. that. Yeah. So you, even if you buy the lower end, you still have to pay the premium price that the monster is paying for their accessories. So this Komodo's, I like they're using third party accessories now, right? Yeah, for the first time ever. Does that nullify my DSMC two accessories? That's what I'm curious about. Like, can I still use my red product, or am I going to have to sell everything off and like kind of yeah alienate my? Because right now my equipment, I can rent you know, a helium brain and save money on all the accessories because I still have all that to apply to. Hmm, that's a good point. I mean, yeah, basically it's it's all third party. So the it's not DSMC2 for, for any of the accessories. So nothing is compatible. I'm sure like Wooden Camera or some other brand will make like a connectivity piece that allows you to, you know, like mount yeah, your DSMC2 monitor. Yeah, they'll probably be able to do some kind of like weird uh cable magic it just seems like that's what i mean like if i have my 4.7 inch dsmc2 touch i should be able to use that on whatever cameras they they offer but i am kind of excited i mean yeah we could talk about the komodo now if you want i was going to save it for the end but um, okay no but yeah while we're talking about it i mean just because it's you know good transition um so yeah a couple things about it like we said it's uh it's all third-party stuff, so they're going to be using Canon BP style of batteries. I think those are the types of batteries. Same batteries on the C300 and everything, and it's mm-hmm. it can use two batteries at once. So the back battery plate has two slots, so it's hot. There swappable. you go. Because I was going to say, just it feels like I don't know how good that would last, even like if you're recording. So they're pretty. Compression, but... They're pretty legit large batteries, and uh, um, you can have two of them. So yeah, hot swappable. And yeah, apparently it, the battery life should be very, very good on it. Um, mm. so yeah, from what I see, I'm seeing like only positive feedback from people about that. Um, another nice thing is it has like basically a screen built into it, not for monitoring the image, but for changing the settings and buttons on the edges of the screen, just like, uh, you know, the Alexa would have. So you can adjust all the settings just from buttons on the camera without having to buy any additional modules or anything. That's um, nice. Yeah, so that looks really nice. The and touchscreen's on the top, right? Yeah, it's like sort of on the top, just in front of where the battery is. You also get, like, you can see image through that too. Now it's it, tiny. Hey, it's a oh. tiny, tiny screen, but you do get reference of image on there. Okay, that's pretty cool. I didn't even know that. Cool. Which is interesting because even though it's a tiny image, I assume there'll be a third party that'll probably make a magnifying, like adaptable viewfinder that can go right on top, you know? Oh, that'd be pretty sweet, huh? It's yeah, not, like, like some kind of not, visual. Maybe, yeah, maybe we should make it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I guess, yeah, that, that'll be really great for if you're using it for like a crash camera or something. Mm-hmm. Because that way you don't need to like mount a monitor. Well, Red is marketing it as a B camera, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, they yeah. have to. Why would they be like, here's a new A camera? For that. Yeah. So, so it does like sort of fulfill a need on the higher end market. Yeah, it'll definitely it, be it a good drone camera. SDI, 12G SDI, so you can output 4K. Yep. Um, and the so, thing is, I, I don't know if this is true, but I heard that you could swap between a global and rolling shutter. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's true. I did hear it's a rolling shutter sensor, though. Like, it will be... It will have that capability, which is good. Everybody's really excited about that. But the problem with rolling ever... shutter is like you, it's better with low light, but it's like the movement you get the like the bad movement with rolling shutter. Yeah, I wonder if that's maybe a for a frame rate thing. Like in order to allow you to ha- shoot higher frame rates, maybe you can you have to like drop to you know the rolling shutter. That might be interesting. That would be nice, though, if it's like, well, you have to drop to rolling shutter, but at least you get 240 frames or something, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, just, I'd prefer not to have any rolling shutter. But it is Super 35, basically. Yeah. 6K. Now, um, here's what's weird. It's a fixed Canon RF mount. Yes, that is true, but I think you can get the body in PL. N- I'm, no, I'm pretty sure it's just a fixed or RF it's PL mount. adaptable. Adaptable. So I, yeah, yeah, you can, you can you can use PL mount lenses with it. It does have a short flange distance, so I believe that 
there can or will be an RF to PL. I don't know if there is yet. Okay. Like if this comes out, there definitely will be. There might already be, but Canon does mention, have RF lenses. That's that's like kind of yeah. It's, it's like, like a new, new, thing. Yeah. new line. They're not uh, cheap. They're thousands. They're thousands of dollars. Like two, three thousand dollar lenses. Yeah. I should mention that this is all um, slightly speculative. Like most of this is basically set in stone, but the camera's not out yet. So we're all no. just going off of what we've yeah, everything's subject to change, yada yada, as of March twenty fourth, quarantine twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah. And but a lot of this does come from Jared Land himself. Yeah. On Red User. Yeah. Oh, and so it's such a big bummer. I think I've told you this before, but so I just recently bought a small HD monitor. I intended to a buy focus? Yeah, the, the Focus Five. And I, I meant to buy the SDI version of it, but oh, somehow you got I got the HDMI version. And the Komodo is only going to have an SDI port for the video out. So um, if if I wind up going to Komodo, I'm going to have to wind up like selling my small HD and getting a new one, mm-hmm. which is fine, but it'll just be like sort of an inconvenience. But I'm like so mad that I accidentally bought the wrong one. I literally just clicked the wrong one. I'll just start using my uh, my 702 Bright, I guess. Yes, which which will be, it'll pair awesome with it. Um Red will make, they'll make, even though they'll be third party, I guarantee they'll make like their own accessories too for the Komodo. They why might not, honestly? Why avoid it? Not. I think just because it's like a lower, a lower end camera, you know? I don't know if they're going to want to invest a lot of resources into developing a monitor when Small HD already has awesome monitors. Maybe I should hold my tongue on this remark, but I, it almost feels like. <laughs> it's, this is like red has like a like an apple steve jobs situation here where they were like closed system everything proprietary they're like their own you're paying for the like the boutique of their brand and camera and like it's a closed system and no third party or anything and then that guy pressed on with the hydrogen and it failed and he randomly he said because of health but it's coincidental drops away from the company jared land (laughs) takes position and it just goes windows and completely open system like yeah like a steve wozniak of what he wanted you know it's like the tale of steve jobs is wrong (laughs) and and it goes the other way so we'll see how that goes yeah steve jobs in the end was was right so like sort of what this is right choice for red or a bad choice i don't know it's definitely what it seems like is happening um but like something that's interesting that we we've talked about before, not uh, in podcasts, but what's interesting for me is like this whole idea that on paper, specs wise, what we see so far out of the Komodo is it will be probably around at par with the Scarlet W. I mean, it's going to have higher resolution, a slightly larger sensor. Not sure what the uh, uh, we don't you know, have what, any specs what the frame the rates are going to be. Do we? Um, it's going to be, it's not a dragon sensor. It's a brand new sensor. So we don't know how good the color science is going to be. I kind of wish it was a dragon sensor. Uh, but, I mean, I mean it might, it might be better, be better. you know, yeah. but we don't know yet. But so anyway, what's nice about it is it's going to be small. It's going to be lightweight. I think they said something around like three pounds or something. Mm-hmm. So tiny. I've seen a, images tiny. Yeah. Super duper tiny, like four inches in its largest dimension. So yeah, it's going to be like a little, like smaller than the pocket camera basically. Um, but I'm in this dilemma because I own a Scarlet W, you own a Raven. Mm -hmm. Um, at this point they're saying it's probably going to be around $6,000 for the Komodo. Yeah. I've heard between five to seven. Yeah. And, uh, so it's like, do you do, by the time the Komodo comes out, is the Scarlet W and the Raven going to drop in price so much that they will be the same price point? Um, or... Well, the Scarlet W, and I'm not sure about the Raven, but the Scarlet W, at least, will it still have as much value? And it's like, do you potentially downgrade to something that's cheaper because it's going to be better on specs and just having a smaller camera is going to be nicer to use? Um, But if we do that, even though both cameras are probably around the same value monetarily, Mm -hmm. I feel like the Komodo is still going to be seen as a B camera um, or like, like a lower end prosumer camera you know oh it has to so it's just, like it's just weird. for the sake here's here's what alienates it the fact that it's not 
proprietary like all their other cameras. Now you have True. to rent all new shit for this camera. So if we're going to go on production, it's like, okay, I have my Helium's my main one and I need a B camera. If I was going to go Komodo, I have to get, okay, new batteries, new battery chargers, new type of memory for that. I can't just be all in one system. So that's yeah. the downside of its alienation. It forces it into the lower end market with like black magic and such. Yeah. So it's like, it might be slightly better on paper specs wise for me to use and I might enjoy using it even more and stuff, but is yeah. it the right business decision? Exactly. Right? It, for your the, way, the way the market is going to interpret it is, yeah, uh, that's, that's where I, I see the biggest it has autofocus. Now. I, I'm not sure it's going to be any good, but who knows? Maybe <laughs> it supposedly has a face tracking autofocus. Wow. It's like Canon. Damn. And 16 bit R3D red code raw recording, which is crazy good. Like it does 6k more. 50 frames a second, I think, which is, it's kind of a weird frame rate to teeter off at 50. No, I think it's probably just for the, the British people, you know, who are shooting at 25 frames or the Canadian people. You know, so when they, they can shoot at 50, so they get, they get pure 50% slow motion, but for us, we're at 48 frames, you know, but that's pretty nice. Yeah, that's, that's pretty nice for me. Um, usually, I mean, whenever I'm at 5k on my Scarlet W, I don't really go above. I mean, you can't go above 50 at 5k on the Scarlet W. So to get 50 at 6k on Komodo is like, that's fine happy with that it's yeah. not it's not a downgrade by any means the type of compression we're getting out of this the type of baked in image and there's got to be restrictions. there's no way they can like they can get that close to the products they already that already exist you know well i wonder maybe that's why they're going with uh, all the third party stuff is that's how they're getting it cheaper they're offering the exact same camera with third party stuff so they can get the price lower Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, yeah, from a camera operator's perspective, it's going to be a dream to use and we're going to get a great image, but from a market perspective, we're going to be on like a lower end in the market now. I don't know. Ultimately, this just expresses the conundrum of the industry right now that yeah. it shouldn't even matter what tool we have, you know, that should be up to us as the, the cinematographers or the director to like kind of come to the conclusion of the best tool for the job, but it comes down to like what's trendy, what's flashy, what's new, what everyone's using and comparing. Well, this was shot with that, so we should use this, even though it might not be the best tool for the job. It it's we shouldn't if this is the better tool, it should just be a better business decision, but that's not necessarily the case. Right. So and it, it kind of reminds me of Philip Bloom just put out, and this is kind of a good segue into the next camera I want to talk about, which is the new FX9. Mm-hmm. But Philip Bloom just put out this two hour long FX9 review. Um, and in that review, he talked about He's way back, back when. He's back. In like 2014 or so. Yeah, yeah. In like 2014 or so, when he was shooting the Wonderlist, um, he started shooting that on the Sony uh, F5 and then wound up switching to the FS7 when the FS7 came out. Um, Mm -hmm. not because the FS7 is a better camera, but just because it was a little smaller and more lightweight and easier for him to use. Um, even though technically the F5 maybe has slightly better image quality as well, it's just a bigger, heavier camera. Um, and I just found, I just saw like a direct relationship to that, um, you know, story to sort of what I'm going through right now, which is like, do I switch to like a smaller camera that might be better for the type of work I shoot? That's mm-hmm. going to have like, I don't know. It's not necessarily going to be, it might not be as good as the camera I have now, but will it be better? Um, yeah. So anyways. <laughs> Cause we also want to stay at the forefront of technology. Right. But it doesn't, it's, it's, yeah, it's a conundrum because it's like, it's not necessarily what's best, but I also want four or six K raw. Like I want six K raw. If I can get it at a cheap price point, I want it for sure. But I also don't want to like, lose my work and like sacrifice image quality over it. Like my cell phone shoots 4k, you know, my iPhone shoots 4k, but if I put it next to my reds 4k, like it's, it's not a question. Like there's no competition. Yeah. I guess that's where I'm just curious. It's like, are we just chasing resolution and red fashion or are we actually constructing like a, a 
excellent sensor at a low price point, like like it seems like Black Magic's doing. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I'm very well, or a comparable that. sensor, I should say. If if we have no IR built into their sensors, then I would not say excellent. <laughs> but pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Just because everyone else is out there with it. So tell me about the Sony. I, I don't know too much about this camera either. Okay, cool. Very excited to tell you all about this camera. Uh, it's very, very interesting how the new Sony FX9 compares to FX9. the FS7. Yeah, FX9. Uh, mm-hmm. How it compares to the old school FS7. Now, technically, I think Sony has come out and said the FX9 isn't a direct replacement for the FS7. But it's, I find it really funny that they say that because... They don't want to slow sales. It's still selling. It's like a camera yeah. no one really needs yet. Yeah. But they... <laughs> that I mean, that's my take on it. Yeah, no, I, I kind of agree with you. Um, it's it's like super weird because the, the FS7 is still at the same price, new, as it was back when it came out in 2014. It's still selling for $10,000 new. And then the FX9 is selling... I mean, it's a brand new camera. It's selling for eleven thousand dollars for the for the brain. So it's mm. only a thousand dollars more, um, mm. and it's basically like when you compare the two body types and the two specs side by side, it's basically just an upgraded FS7. So I'll go through the specs for you and compare the two. So um, for one, the the FX9 is a full frame sensor, six K. Mm-hmm. Um, it has really good autofocus face detection, which full frame, like, yeah, full frame, full frame. That's, that's a that's big difference. Hurts. Yeah. And you see it immediately in how shallow the depth of field is and it's low light capabilities and everything. And it's 6k. Do you think um, all the cameras and lens companies make a deal and they all like go like, is this the year? Okay. We're all <laughs> going to go full frame. Cause we like the lens companies need to make all new lenses. Yeah. So, I wonder, are they blindsided or is there like a, all right, are we all in this? Okay, we all sign off and we're moving off, all of us moving forward to full frame. I wonder. <laughs> I mean, I don't think between camera companies they're doing that, but it, like, I, I mean, for instance, like Red will definitely send the Komodo specs to like wooden camera and stuff ahead of time so they can mm-hmm. start creating like supplementary products. Um, but yeah, and I, I think everyone, I think it's like their job to oh, predict trends. I forgot to mention stuff. before we go too far with the, the that RF is that Canon oh. does make an RF to EF adapter. So with oh. the Komodo, you'll be able to get back to using EF lenses. Um, so there'll probably be an RF to PL. But the RF to EF adapter that Canon makes has a variable ND built into it. Right, and that's what makes it really, really so cool. So therefore, you can get variable ND on your Komodo. That's pretty awesome. With EF glass, which is, that would be crazy. Crazy cool. <laughs> Make that a nice little run and gun. It would be great for like the small commercial work, you know? Yeah, and documentary work, especially. Imagine Wedding walking around with it. like super cinematic, like that type of stuff would be perfect. Yeah, three pound camera on like a, uh, the... The uh, Zion crane, however you pronounce it, mm-hmm. gimbal. Yeah, it, it would be sick. It would be so easy to use. <laughs> but uh, um, sorry, okay. I just I, I didn't want I want to say before I let that thought slip. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it. That's that's really cool. Um, let's, so let's see what else. Um, yeah, so the FX9 also has really good autofocus face detection that Philip Bloom is obsessed with. Um, mm-hmm. He spent like 30 minutes in his two hour review just doing uh autofocus tests um another big thing and this is a huge trend that we're seeing amongst a lot of new cameras out we well, see it in the pocket 6k we see it in the komodo is the dual iso mm. now we're seeing the dual iso for the fx9 is 804,000, whereas um what we see in the pocket camera is 800 yeah uh, Actually, I take back what I said about the Komodo. I'm not sure if it's dual ISO. I haven't heard anything about that or read anything. Okay, I take back. I take back that. So uh, that's not confirmed. That might have just been my my brain going or getting excited. <laughs> um, <laughs> so otherwise, um, it's got 4K 10 bit internal. That's what the Gemini has, frame. you know. Oh yeah, the Gemini. That's what I'm thinking of. The Gemini. Yeah. So we're seeing it with the Gemini. We're seeing it with the FX9. We're seeing it with the pocket camera, and. Uh, probably many others to come in the future um we're seeing it on our macs on our iphones light mode dark mode oh yeah (laughs) 
I mean, yeah, that's actually true. Just a different word for it. Yeah. Um, so it does 4K 10-bit internal up to 60 frames, four-channel audio, which is pretty cool, um, external 16-bit 10 bit. raw. 10-bit, good, but still on the lower end compared to Red and Ari. Yeah. Um, but external, are up there, you know? external, okay, can do, external, it can do 16 bit. They're um, big on that. Canon and Sony, they're raw. all about that external recording. Yeah. I guess it's just, just, yeah. just put it in the camera. What's going on? <laughs> it makes it cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have, as, you don't have to have as much processing power. And yeah. when it starts getting like, that's my theory is like, I mean, what you see is the price point seems to be directly related to how large the sensor is. Yeah. Like that's why the pocket camera can be as cheap as it is, is because it's just a 35 millimeter sensor. Whereas the Komodo is even a little bit larger than that. It's a little more expensive Then you get up to the FX nine. It's a full mm. frame and it's even more expensive. Um, so kind of similar deal. Um, so, so compare that to the FS seven, the FS seven doesn't have the dual native ISO. It doesn't have the autofocus face detection. Um, it doesn't have the six K full frame sensor. It's just a super 35, four K sensor. Um, and it doesn't have quite as good external recording capabilities. Um, also, what's really interesting is the FX9 has a brand new color science, um, which seems to be more similar to the Sony Venice. So mm. it's a little bit more of like that cinematic look. And I know you and I are both like very uh, like critical of Sony color science. Um, we, we've never really been a fan of it. We prefer Canon and Red. Um, yeah. I mean, I do like it for like, I think it looks great depending what the content is like yeah like web content or like documentary looks looks good or like sports you know you see like a lot of skaters using it and it looks great for that type of stuff things where they're recording at higher frame rates like i mean i still it still looks video to me but like it's fine it's fine for those formats to me but i don't know yeah i mean in generally when i see them side by side the sony definitely seems to be representing color pretty accurately compared to like a canon which is a little bit more warmer, a little bit more green. But in mm. return, what you get out of that for Canon is it makes skin tones look nicer. So yeah. although Sony seems to be a little bit more it's accurate. A little bit more life to the image. Yeah, skin tones just don't look as as attractive on the Sony, in my opinion. To do some more work in the post. Exactly. Um, and that's, that's also a thing is like I just haven't mastered shooting with Sony either. Right, yeah. Um, so also in terms of the color science, um, that means that the, that S log three is no longer a thing with the FX nine. Mm. There's a new primary mode that's called S cine tone. So there's a little more contrast, a little more saturation right out of camera makes it easier to grade. Um, and it, yeah, the color, like color, color, color is. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, uh, I guess it's, yeah, like a good comparison. Um, yeah, and then also the the last thing to mention is just that uh yeah you're getting better low light now because it's a, it's a larger sensor and it's got the dual native ISO, so um, you've got basically four thousand ISO that looks as clean as eight hundred ISO. That's um, insane. Yeah, so it's nice. I mean, but but with that, like, where can you use that? You know, like without the highlights becoming orbs. Oh no! Yeah, I see what you mean. Um. I feel like you don't get highlights with orbs like that, that become like pure, just like blown out, you know, like street lights and stuff. Um, you don't really get that at 4,000, but you get that like at like 10,000 or, you know, beyond. Hmm. So yeah, Philip Bloom has a great review on, you know, video on his channel and he shows 4,000. So it handles the highlights well at 4,000. Yeah. Like, like if you're looking at like street lights in the distance or car lights and stuff, um, 4,000 is like, seems to be pretty good for when you're in like like a nighttime urban environment and you literally have no lights. Um, he's, he even pushed the camera far beyond 4,000 and it looks like really good. So it's kind of incredible. Um, but this thing's a beast, right? This isn't like a walk around camera. It's basically a similar form factor as the FS7 is. Oh, really? It's not like hefty? Well, I've never held it, so I don't know how heavy it is. Um, I would assume it's probably about the same weight. I thought it was like heavy. I thought this this thing was a heavy camera. Yeah, I'm not sure. It might have like uh, better build quality. You know, it might be more like more rugged. Weight of the Sony FX9. Let's see here. Oh, 4.4 pounds. Oh my gosh, really? That's it? 
So for anybody that doesn't know, like our reds are like nine pounds. I mean, they're like pure well, metal construction. Brain. This is the brain. So our brains are three and a half to four pounds. Oh, okay. Fair enough. And the Sony brain is. Yeah. Our, is like our batteries pounds. alone are two pounds. So <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So yeah, it's t- totally doable. If you're like a documentary, you know, run and gun filmmaker yeah, Four channel, four channel audio. Stops, nice. 15 stops of dynamic rage. Yeah. That's like crazy. <laughs> that's very good. Electronic ND. Oh yeah. So that's like sort of a new thing, um, which is really nice. It's auto. That'd mm-hmm. be weird if it's just like shifting in your image. <laughs> yeah, but it's like sort of seamless. Like you don't see it happening. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It's like a variable. Huh. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah, Philip Bloom shows it in his review. Pretty great. But yeah. just what, what blows me away is just now like the FS7, six years later, um, we have a replacement for it that's only $1,000 more, but the FS7 mm-hmm. is still an incredible camera. It the still name, holds up after brand it caught on. Yeah. Like you don't see a six year old red, like the original, like, like the Scarlet, like the MX. I know? see posts. It just says like camera FS seven. Like that's what they want. Yeah. Like there's cameras that, yeah, you could, I bet like you could have an FX nine and you would have to sit there and plead your case. Yeah. So it's, it's really fascinating how like on one side of the industry, we have all these cameras that are coming out undercutting themselves Mm-hmm. And then on the other side of the market, you have cameras that are like six years old that are still the most desirable camera in the industry. Yeah, it's interesting. And I still see a lot of um, F5s and C300 Mark IIs and even like smaller, like the Sony mirrorless A7s and stuff as B cameras. Um, I still see a lot of those as well, but the FS7 is always like at the top of the list like most desirable. So I'm like really curious to see if in the next couple of years as producers and directors, um, you know, start getting acquainted with like what's new. If we start seeing FX nines, uh, grow in popularity. I mean, because it's still a brand new camera. Like it just came out. Like the only people that are really aware of it are people like us, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, it's kind of crazy. Well, since we're talking about cameras, like, and and like current cameras we should just mention i guess the new alexa mini lf even though it's like on the higher end oh yeah yeah totally yeah for sure again another large format camera very popular a lot of people seem to be going towards it also a lot of people going towards the sony venice which is full frame yeah like our buddy ethan has just shot like two documentary like reality he's been using a sony yeah for the past couple of years so it's crazy yeah the so we what we talked about we have that one DX Mark III coming in at around six thousand. You brought up the Pocket Six K coming in under three thousand. We have the Komodo between five to seven thousand. Uh, we have about the ten to eleven thousand for the PX Nine FX Nine. And sorry, yeah, there we go. The wait, the what? The Sony the FX Nine. Yeah. FX9. PMW, PMW yeah. FX9. Sorry. And then we have the RE Alexa Mini LF coming in at 58,000. <laughs> like basic camera package that they offer. It's like 58 grand, I think. So that way different, you know? Way different. <laughs> yeah, you presented that as like, it was like a punchline. <laughs> like, that made me laugh. It still, it still relates to what's trending and what's going on. So, like, Red kind of revolutionized with a smaller format camera that puts out big image, you know, like big big results from yeah. a small body. And then the Alexa chased it with the mini. We had DSLRs on the rise. Cameras kept getting smaller, and that was the trend. And it still is the trend. Um, and so the... But the Alexa is still the leading brand in shooting movies, like hands down. Yeah. Um, Honey Boy, they use the Alexa mini. The Ford versus Ferrari, they use the LF. Joker, they use the Alexa 65. Um, which... Harvey's so weird. Like the Alexa 65 is like three sensors together. <laughs> and then they two? say that the mi- I, I think it's like two stacked on top of each other or something, but it might be three. I don't know. No, well, that's what the that's what the LF is. Mm, okay. Right, because 65 is 
Well, yeah, those two confuse me. Yeah. So, but basically, this Alexa Mini LF is basically a, an updated Alexa Mini body, essentially the same size and form factor as the Alexa Mini. Yeah. So, but you see Ari moving to a smaller footprint. I mean, their cameras used to be huge, like the XTs and what have you. Right. They're big camera. That like built for the shoulder, you know. Even the the Amira, it's a hefty camera. But they put like better user buttons on the op side, so you have more of those. You have media slots on the op side, so that's kind of mirroring what Red did. It just shows like you see these companies starting to, I don't want to say copying, but like taking good ideas from other brands and implementing them because it's just what makes sense moving forward. Yeah, you know, like one brand may have revolutionized and created something, but to implement it, would, to not implement it across the board, if that's a better standard way, would just be a disservice. Exactly. Just because, like, so it's good that that's happening. Because I think the the memory used to be on the back of the Alexa Mini, which is like not the best place for it. It's nice to have it there, back on the side, like Red does. Although they, I'll get into that because I have like. I made like a few notes of like trends I'm noticing. Um, yeah, go for it. Now's the time. I was going to mention the the media, but I'm going to hold off on that because I just want to finish this up real quick. Okay. So I'm trying to see. So again, the Alexa Mini LF is large format. They already have like a large format Ari camera, but it's big. It's a big, hefty camera. So then they made a new Alexa Mini LF which is the Lexa mini body, but large format. So it's a new sensor. And yeah, it's one and a half times larger than its previous sensor. And it's two ALEV sensors flipped vertically stitched together. Mm. That's how like Ari does their yeah. sensors, I guess. So this is a 4.5K camera max. So they're not chasing resolution. They're not trying to win that battle. Even though this the basic camera package is $58,000, this camera is a 4.5K camera, where the $6,000 1DX is a 5.5K raw camera. So that's just right there showing how there's a lot more to it than just the resolution. Right. And um, that makes like where the Komodo falls. could It could be on either side of the court still, you know? Yeah. Um, it's a new mount. So I guess Ari invented the PL mount, right? The, the and LPL. Now they have- well, now they have the LPL mount, but I oh, believe right. they invented the yeah. PL mount too. Yeah. And the, there's an EF mount coming to the Alexa Mini LF. Oh, that's interesting. So the LPL mount will, like they have, a, you can already mount it to PL, like an LPL to PL. Right. But Ari's coming with an LPL to EF, which will make like, which will bring Canon little, yeah, little Canon lenses to the Alexa Mini LF. That's going to be a weird sight. <laughs> Because Canon L glass is full frame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could totally make it work. It's just we've never seen that before. That's kind of cool. So I mean, looking, not, right? at, looking at all the cameras we just talked about and then ending with like the big new big budget industry standard, because I do believe this is, Alexa Mini LF is going to be out there a lot. Oh, yeah. I don't know if it's going to take over just because the Alexa Mini is just so, it might take a while and maybe it will, but. The Alexa Mini is just so ingrained. It still seems to be like the, the one people are using. But if this large format trend kicks off, then yeah, this Mini LF is gonna gonna be the main Alexa for a while. I think. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I but, think over the next couple of years, we're definitely gonna be seeing that trend towards the larger sensor. Things are are getting so cheap and and so small and lightweight now. Like, yes, why not? I was gonna say the one of the biggest trends is like smaller form factor. Still, we keep getting smaller. We're not satisfied. We, kill, we still keep, want our cameras smaller and they keep getting smaller without sacrificing quality. The quality gets better and the cameras get smaller. It doesn't make sense. What's really interesting and funny uh, and sort of ironic that I find about that whole thing is like when I think when Ari originally came out with the Alexa Mini, they were saying like, okay, you still have like the Alexa SXT or whatever. And mm-hmm. now we have, this is the same camera, but it's smaller. So you can use it with your drone and you can use it with your gimbal and all that, they weren't advertising it as like, this is your new go-to standard camera. And then it was like the industry and operators and stuff like realized after using it, like, oh no, like this is just better than the old one. And we're only going to use the small one now. And so now it's like trending towards that for everything. It's kind of interesting. 
I also see dynamic ranges getting better with cameras. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're actually starting to talk about it. Like, you kind of just got what you got. I mean, what I think, what was it? Like eight stops maybe with the 5D Mark II? I yeah. could be wrong there, but oh, it was yeah. very minimal. You know, there wasn't much. You're baking in what you got. Dynamic range, like cameras are getting cheaper with dynamic range is just getting better and better. Um, What would I say? Lower light. That's a new trend. These cameras are getting better in low light. Yeah, definitely a huge trend. Specifically, when we talk about low light, we talk about the uh, the dual native ISO is like the the big the new big selling point nowadays. Mm. It's like That's the crazy. best of both, best of both worlds because you can still have that that base eight hundred which everybody loves and is familiar with, and it's like everybody already sort of knows what light level will give you like an f two eight reading at eight hundred ISO. Like we we are so ingrained in lighting to eight hundred ISO, like we just know. Um, so you still get that, but then you have like this, this secondary option now where for the, you know, the different setting, you get the same latitude, same dynamic range and no additional noise. So yeah. it'll be nice for a lot of those, whether you're shooting a documentary and you're not, you're not lighting it at all, or if you're just shooting a low budget film where you don't have a big light package. Um, and like, uh, you'll see, like, I think I'm predicting like, um, a whole new lighting style that's much more centric on just using practicals and less mm -hmm. film lights, less like smaller footprints for genie stuff. That would be interesting. It would shake up the industry. It's going to see how, how the industry, or, it'll be interesting to see how the industry adapts. Like you mentioned Honey Boy earlier, that, that's sort of yeah. how they shot Honey Boy. A lot of it was just practical lights. Um, yeah, I believe they said a crew of like six or so. Yeah, really small crew. Same. Like a, true a lot of it was like, um, you know, they would have the, the practicals, they would have set up um, like the RGB LED bulbs, you know, so they mm -hmm. can like control the intensity, the color temperature, basically every, any color of the rainbow. And they could, they could adjust it from an iPhone app basically. And that, that was like the main source of a lot of their lighting, which is like crazy. So, I see that, uh, I mean, like always, we're chasing resolution now. Higher resolution. But now, it used to be 4K was the big chase. And we're, I still, even with 4K out, you know, I've had a 4K TV for years. YouTube's been supporting 4K for years. It still doesn't feel fully standardized, 4K. Yeah, yeah. It still agree. feels like we're ahead of the curve by using it and shooting in it and putting content out in 4K. Even though it's, on for us as creators, it's standard of what we use, like, like not shooting 4k like i i mean only for my youtube videos do i not shoot 4k and even then i'm usually shooting 4k <laughs> so but for the real world it seems like 1080 is still pretty standard yet here we are putting out cameras where the new standard is 6k to 8k is what we're getting now you know 4k cameras are yeah all these cameras are shooting 4k now that's like the minimum every camera we've mentioned shoots over 4k minus the Alexa Mini LF is in the 4K range of 4.5K, the most expensive camera. Yeah. It's just very interesting. Yeah. What are we going to do with 5.5K out of our Canon? <laughs> I don't know. Longevity, preservation. I guess the this, this same argument was said already with 4K. It just keeps continuing. There are 8K monitors out there already. I mean, Ari had one, right? We were just at Ari. Yeah. testing out the mini lf and didn't yeah. they have an AK monitor yeah so why don't you tell that story just how cool that was and and everything yeah the uh i guess a rep over at ari reached out to me on linkedin and invited me to come over and test out the new alexa mini lf and the ari signature primes and i brought i brought brendan as my as my first ac just I don't know. <laughs> i'm sure i could have just had a just brought you i just well, yeah. he invited me and i just said can i bring my first technically i am your first so like technically. Yeah. So that oh. was cool. Yeah, it was cool. We got to, I mean, that's how I got the knowledge I, I gave yeah. today on the mini LF. And we got uh, our little, like, uh, our, it was like right when uh, the Corona yeah. was just kicking off, like barely hearing about it in the news, you know, Wuhan was in debate of whether it was like being played up or not by the media. And the U S felt untouched and Donald Trump was still telling everybody everything is fine. <laughs> That's when we went. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> really cool experience. And we also got to check out the um, the new, the full frame RE signature primes, the magnesium housing LPL lenses. Mm-hmm. And boy, were those awesome. Pro- probably like the nicest, light. the nicest lenses I've ever seen in terms of like the quality of how they look and also like how they're built. I just love how light. Yeah. It's like, it's the best. So for anyone that doesn't know, the RE signature primes, um, they're built with this magnesium housing instead of like what you normally see, which is like the aircraft grade aluminum. Mm -hmm. So magnesium is like a stronger alloy or not even an alloy. I think it's just like a basic uh, metallic element or whatever, Um, but it's much lighter weight. So you have these lenses, which are big full frame lenses that look like they must weigh like five pounds a lens and they weigh like two pounds a lens. I don't know the exact weight of them. They're they're big. They, they resemble like zoom lenses, the, the, the housing size of them, but yeah, yeah, the weight just does not match up and it's amazing. And I love it. And I want all lenses to be that light. Yeah. I have no idea how expensive, I mean, I'm sure they're very expensive. Um, but in, and in terms of the quality of the images, the, like, um, basically the RE rep was, was showing us every aspect to the, the traits of, how these lenses look zero breathing we're talking a rack focus from infinity all the way to like minimum focus is like zero breathing zero chromatic aberration um very sharp like perfect contrast they handle flares incredibly um it's just kind of nuts it's like they're optically perfect (laughs) and uh in terms of chromatic aberration it was actually pretty like that was pretty mind-blowing in and of itself they were comparing the signature primes to a couple of other different lenses and just showing how the chromatic aberration compares to other lenses. Primes, right? Um, yeah, I think the, the ultra primes, primes, I think the cooks. The yeah. Um, did and, they know they, they kept it in house? They compared it to their own stuff. I thought, no, I think, I think they also compared it to cooks. I think he mentioned cooks, but technically mm. on the PowerPoint, he was showing us, it was like listed as like other, mm. <laughs> Um, just the breathing alone. Amazing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We were pretty blown away. Amazingly good. Like none, non-existent. So yeah. Not like amazing breathing. It's just <laughs> so much. Um, uh, so yeah. So full frame, full frame camera. That's the push. Mm-hmm. So what's the benefit of full frame? Low, better low light, right? You can take in more light. Yeah. Better low light. So like that's, uh, Ari's big thing more information. is. The, the reason they say they don't push for the high resolution is um, with less pixels on a larger frame size, the photosites or like the pixels themselves are larger. So it makes them more sensitive to light. So you just get more exposure. You get better low light sensitivity. Um, so you don't have as They're much resolution. Some, some tactical German engineering over there. Yeah. They're, they're getting it just right and perfect. They're in no rush. They're going to take their time and it's going to work great and practical. Just like a Volkswagen before yeah. the scandal. Yeah. The that was Volkswagen. like not the ones that try to hide emissions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was like one of the I'm probably, not sure up to something, Ari. I don't know. <laughs> that was one of the big takeaways for me when we visited was just uh like how perfect of a system it felt. And uh they have all their accessories just well oiled machine. Medicine. Yeah. So it just seems like a really nice camera to use. I wish I had the opportunity to use it more often. And you don't really, I mean, maybe you do realize it, but I work with RE products all the time, but I didn't really feel the weight of their ecosystem until I was in their building. And after I watched their presentation video and I went to the back and I'm like, this whole set is lit by RE. We're shooting on RE. The lenses are RE, like marked, you know. The follow focus is so, RE. Follow focus, yeah. The, the Fizz unit was RE. And it's just like, they... It's not just about pumping out the best image for them. It's about making the best quality films. You know, they're they're there, and or making making films the best and easy way, and most cinematic way possible. And they're there every step of the process. Yeah, and the system. Red tried to dabble by making like lenses, right? Which suck. But they just <laughs> they. And aren't they kind of slow? Like they're not that fast either. Yeah, they're slow. They're big. They're heavy. <laughs> Well, they're, they're Sigma lenses rehoused. Yeah. Well, they're Sigma lenses, but 
Yeah, just interesting. That's why Red and Sigma have such like a partnership. You always see Red like signing off on Sigma. Um. Anyway, what else was I going to say? So yeah, full frame, large format. But a complaint I have is the media still keeps changing. We still can't like settle mm-hmm. on like on like a unified format. Like I guess that's what Apple was trying to do with USB C with their their ports. It's it's. It's just annoying that it's like, okay, I have SSDs for my red, but now if I get the Komodo, I got to go to CFast 2.0. While yes, it's cheaper and people that don't already have SSDs, it's a better entryway in. But then you see like the 1DX Mark II is using what they call CF Express cards. And Ari uses their own standard new SSD that's like incredibly expensive. And then what does Blackmagic use? They use third-party SSDs or are they on CFast? Yeah, I so it technically it has an. I think it has an internal CFast, but like for the pocket camera, what I'm seeing most people use is just a off market, um, just SSD. Hmm. So, so that's just like I think SSD is the answer here. Like we should all be moving towards that. I don't disagree with Red and are using SSD. I just think we need lower budget SSD options. You know. Yeah, yeah. Like the hard drives are coming down significantly in price. And there's different stages to the SSD drives. You can have slower ones versus faster ones. I just think we should all just agree that SSD is the standard format we should be moving towards and then just have different write speeds with lower prices and just standardize it that way instead of dancing around these CF cards and SSDs and everything else, you know? Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that at all. you can just have like one reader. Yeah. That makes perfect sense to me. Hopefully uh, that's what we see trending. And then I also want longer battery life, which you say these new Canon BPs that uh, Red the Komodo is using. Yeah, they should be pretty decent. Like I, we keep upgrading Reds and, and uh, like Ari's and that's great, but I don't know. It just seems like the amount of power draw that we, that we use for these cameras on V mounts and even gold mounts. Like just the, like there has to be a better option. Like they just don't last long enough. You could get a shark fin battery, so you have yeah, two, but then but then it's like heavy as hell. Adds another like three pounds to your camera. Like is is there just no way we can make batteries that last longer? Yeah, that's like the next big thing. What right? In like the next ten years or so, we start seeing like what is it like carbon nanotube batteries that are the size of your pinky. But it's just last. so refreshing to go back to a Sony or Canon camera and then you pop yeah. that battery on and you know like you're good half the day easily. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to worry about it. Where with my Red, I'm like, the first thing I do when I get on set is like these batteries got to get plugged in. Yeah. Like, I just want to make sure that they're constantly on a charger, you know, <laughs> like they're just going to always be charged. And I have like five or six of them V mounts just like out of paranoia that they're I'm not going to be able to charge them in time because they take three hours to charge about but they burn away in like 40 minutes. Yeah. And each one weighs two pounds. So you need a whole backpack or Pelican case just for your batteries and your charger. It's mm-hmm. a, it adds just a whole other thing to your system now. So it's interesting to see what this Komodo does, you know? Yeah. Oh, and another, like, I guess a closing thought is a big bummer with the whole coronavirus thing is um nab is is completely canceled this year they're not even yeah, everything. it. it's just canceled the filmmaking is canceled <laughs> yeah the film we were gonna work on is like pushed to june now yeah every single project i've had in the future is canceled which is why we're generating all this new content which is much needed and i'm glad we're finally doing it yeah me too like i'm actually grateful for the break because it's forcing me to do all the personal stuff that i've literally been making excuses for yeah. By saying like, oh, I have this work, 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 money and all that stuff. It's just like, nope, we took all that away, took that away. And now I can catch up on editing. You saw I put a video out that was. Yep. Yep. From it was our old apartment in Philadelphia. Filmed, filmed eight months ago. You finally put that video out. <laughs> Longer than eight months ago, man. Yeah, probably. Probably almost a year. I think it's going to be funny when the next video is like me with facial hair and long hair and it's just be like, what the hell? Happened? Yeah, people are going to be like, what? <laughs> Not on Thursday. <laughs> like, oh, nice. Like two days later. That's awesome. Cool. Well, I think we can wrap it up there. I think that was a really great episode. That was like really informative yeah, and fun to talk about. 
So yeah. Ooh, one more thing. I want I want EVFs to be cool again. Oh, like like, like in camera, e- like, like not like well, yeah, like using the EVF that came. I know it's like like an accessory, but with the Alexa Mini LF, yeah, it's just so nice to have like an EVF that has menu control. Oh, like I yeah. like that. I like that option. Like that'd be nice if the Komodo could. I mentioned before, like some form of EVF can be adaptable to that little screen, but we'll yeah, see. That's interesting. Huh. I just don't I get to we'll shoot see. with EVFs as much as I used to, and I kind of like them. Yeah, they're just so expensive. I, I've never bought bought into the red yeah, one or the Zakudo or anything. I used, when the I, when I yeah, worked great, but... Western when I would shoot handheld, I had like a bomb EVF I could hook up, and yeah, it was nice. It was nice, but that's it. I just want to see if anyone will implement any EVF accessories. It seems like they're just fading away. We had the Zacuto like Gradical, but it didn't seem to like it caught for a little. But you don't really hear much about EVF products coming out as much. And then Red has one, but it's like three grand. Yeah, that's like, the problem. There's no low budget, affordable EVF options. I guess there is Zacuto. People have said just use Zacutos. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Yeah, well, that's that's all I have. Hope you guys enjoyed that episode. Stay tuned for a lot more. Like we said, we have a lot more coming for you guys in the future. So please subscribe, and we'll catch you guys soon. Thank you very much.